Dr. Sage here. In this video, we're going to talk about population genetics and adaptive evolution. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe different types of variation in a population, explain why only inherited variation can be acted upon by natural selection, describe genetic drift, the bottleneck, and the founder effect, explain how different forces, mechanisms of evolution, can influence the allele frequency of a population, explain ways natural selection can shape populations, and describe how these different forces can lead to different outcomes in terms of population variation. Microevolution is a change in allele frequencies in a population over generations. And there are several mechanisms that can cause allele frequency changes. Examples of which would be genetic drift, bottleneck, gene flow, and natural selection. We're going to discuss these in the lecture today. Of note, out of these, natural selection is the only one that actually causes adaptive evolution, making organisms better suited to their current environment. What is genetic drift? Genetic drift describes how allele frequencies fluctuate unpredictably from one generation to the next. When you see this, it's typically in small populations. The smaller the sample, the greater the chance of deviation from the predicted result. Genetic drift tends to reduce genetic variation through losses of alleles. All right, here's an example. Let's say we have a small population size. In this example, we only have a population of 10 rabbits. Okay, now out of those rabbits, two of them are white colored phenotypes, and eight of them are the brown colored phenotypes, brown being the dominant allele of the two. Now let's say by chance, only these five rabbits reproduce, okay? So they're going to mate and reproduce to produce the next generation. Now, some of those rabbits were heterozygotes. So because of this, in the next generation, you can still get homozygous recessive individuals. Okay, and then let's say in this generation, only these two rabbits happen to mate. Okay, both of those happen to be homozygous dominant, which means in the next generation and all the generations after that, the rabbits are all going to have brown fur. So this is genetic drift. It doesn't necessarily make them better suited to their environment. You know, these rabbits might not be living in a brown colored background. They might be living in a white colored background. So they're not being adapted to their environment the way the natural selection does. Where you see this is in a very small population size. For example, if there were 10,000 rabbits, you wouldn't be seeing genetic drift like this. Another example is bottleneck effect. Okay, a chance event or catastrophe can reduce the genetic variability within a population. The bottleneck effect is a sudden reduction in population size due to a change in the environment. The resulting gene pool may no longer be reflective of the original population's gene pool. So it's called a bottleneck effect because the best way to understand it is like thinking of a bottle. I say this bottle here that has these beads inside it. And there's a variety of different phenotypes of beads. You know, you have some pale orange, some green, some red. You happen to pour out these into a cup and when you do that, you know, only a few can fit through the bottleneck, the neck of the bottle. Okay, and just by chance, none of the red ones happen to come out in the surviving population. So you happen to get a change in the phenotype of the population due to this bottleneck effect. Often when you'll see that is when there's some catastrophe, like there's a, a forest fire that happens to eliminate just by chance, you know, most of the brown colored rabbits, but not the white colored rabbits. Next example is gene flow. So that's where you have like two separate populations, population of green beetles, population of brown beetles. Okay, and one of these brown beetles happens to travel to a different location where these green beetles are. So because of that, those alleles, the genes, are flowing from over here to over here because you're now getting that brown allele over here, whereas it wasn't over here to begin with. So gene flow can occur when an individual travels from one geographic location to another. Gene flow consists of the movement of alleles among populations. Alleles may be transferred through the movement of fertile individuals or gametes, like pollen, through the air. Gene flow tends to reduce variation among populations over time. Of note, it's not only your genes that affect things, it's also your environment. For example, the American alligator. The sex of the American alligator is actually determined by the temperature at which the eggs are incubated. Eggs incubated at 30 degrees Celsius produce females, and the eggs incubated at 33 degrees Celsius produce males. Okay, so now we're going to get into natural selection, where we've learned what natural selection is in a prior video lecture. So evolution by natural selection involves both change and sorting. 
New genetic variations arise by chance, and then beneficial alleles are sorted and favored by natural selection. Differential success in reproduction results in certain alleles being passed to the next generation in greater proportions. Of note, natural selection is the only mechanism that consistently causes adaptive evolution. Organisms are better suited to their current environment. Now remember that natural selection acts on individuals to affect change in a population. An individual does not evolve, like one rabbit doesn't decide, oh, I should have brown fur because it better matches my environment. Natural selection acts upon that individual, but the population is what's evolving. So, there are three modes of natural selection. Directional selection, which favors individuals at one end of a phenotypic range. Diversifying or disruptive selection, which favors individuals at both extremes of the phenotypic range. And stabilizing selection, which favors intermediate variants and acts, against the, and acts against the extreme different phenotypes. So let me give you some examples of these three. First, directional selection. So for example, there are these moths, and those moths can have different phenotypes in the appearance of their color or their pattern. Okay. Now, these lighter colored moths, they hide better they are camouflaged better in the natural environment in like the light colored uh, trees like birch trees for example these moths when they're on the birch tree it's hard for a bird to see it so it's more likely for this moth to be able to escape getting eaten and therefore pass on its genes in the next generation but the environment can change for example during the industrial revolution we produced a lot of pollution what that was doing is it was causing the the barks of those trees to be much darker shading because of the pollution on the on the barks of the trees. In that case, these lighter colored moths would stick out to make it easier for the birds to see them. The few moths that were born just by chance with darker coloring happened to survive longer because they were less likely to be eaten by the birds. So over time, the population shifted from these lighter colored patterns to these darker colored patterns. Okay, that's directional selection. Okay, so the selection is moving in one particular direction. In this case, from lighter color to darker color. So directional selection favors individuals at one end of the phenotypic range. Now remember, again, that natural selection acts on individuals to affect change in a population. Individuals do not evolve, populations evolve. These lighter colored moths didn't say, ooh, I'm going to get eaten, I better turn darker. That's not the way it works. Just by chance, there are lighter colored moths born and darker colored moths born. The lighter colored moths are now at a disadvantage because they're going to get eaten by the birds. So they happen to be killed off and the dark colored moths have an advantage, they can hide better. So over time, the population becomes darker and darker patterns. Next example is diversifying, also called disruptive selection. And it favors individuals at the two extremes of the phenotypic range. So in this example, these rabbits can be a gray color, a white color, or a Himalayan color, which is gray and white in patterns. Let's say these rabbits happen to be living in a rocky environment. And in that case, it's easier for the gray ones and the Himalayan ones to hide because they match nicely with that rocky background, whereas the white ones stick out. So again, what happens due to natural selection, because those rabbits have predators, the predators more easily see the white ones over time, these start to die out. And over time, the population shifts to the two extreme phenotypes, the darker gray and the Himalayan. And you get rid of this middle range phenotype. Last example is stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection favors intermediate variants and acts against extreme phenotypes. So in this example, robins, a type of bird, they typically lay four eggs, okay? They don't lay more than four or less than four eggs. Why? Because if you get more than four eggs, then there's generally not enough food to go around to feed all those babies, birds that are gonna be born. If you lay less than four eggs, then just by chance, you might not have enough survive to pass on their genes to the next generation. So over time, more and more of the robins tend to lay four eggs because that gives them the best evolutionary advantage. And that's called stabilizing selection, which basically stabilizes the middle range, not the two extremes. Okay, 
We also have something called frequency dependent selection. That's where the fitness of a phenotype declines if it becomes too common in a population. If you get a certain phenotype that you get more and more in the population that's a phenotype, it now becomes a disadvantage. Selection can favor whichever phenotype is less common in the population. So one example of frequency dependent selection is this lizard here. So in this lizard, you can have males that can be larger size or smaller size. In this particular example, these yellow-throated ones are smaller than either the blue or the orange-throated males. So the yellow-throated ones look more like females to the female, and they look less like males to the females. So because of this allows the, the males, to, these smaller males basically sneak in and copulate with the females, so it becomes an advantage to have that smaller size, whereas most of them have the larger size. Next we have sexual selection. That's natural selection for mating success. It can also result in sexual dimorphism, which are marked differences between the sexes and secondary sexual characteristics. Some examples of sexual dimorphism is peacocks versus peahens. So if you think of a peacock, you think of this uh, bird that has this large display of feathers. Okay, that's the male of the species. The female of the species does not have that large display of feathers. Okay, so the peacocks have this large display of feathers to try to attract the females to mate with them. Okay, in other examples, the females are larger than the males. Or in other examples, again, the males can have a more distinct colored pattern than the females. Okay, so this is a difference in the sexes as far as their phenotypic appearance. Now with sexual selection, you have different types of sexual selection. Intrasexual selection is competition among individuals of one sex usually the males, from mates of the opposite sex. For example, have you ever seen a nature show where, wa where male walruses are like fighting with each other? Okay, that's an example of intrasexual selection. Intersexual selection, often called mate choice, occurs when individuals of one sex, usually the females, are choosing and selecting their mates. For example, the female is gonna pick the peacock that has the largest display of feathers. Male showiness due to mate choice can increase a male's chance of attracting a female, but it can decrease its chances of survival. So when it comes to natural selection, there's a competition between how am I gonna pass on my genes to the next generation? If those males have a large showy display, like a colored pattern or the big um, feathers of the peacock, it might make the females more likely to mate with them, which makes them more likely to pass on their genes. But on the other hand, that large showy display might also make it more likely for predators to be able to see them and eat them. So, which of the two wins out depends on which is more likely to make your genes pass on gen the next generation. Do you not have many predators? And then you can have this large showy display to increase your chance of mating. Okay, so with natural selection, it increases the frequencies of alleles that enhance survival and reproduction. Adaptive evolution occurs as the mass between an organism and its environment increases. Because the environment can change, adaptive evolution is a continuous process. For example, those moths, before we had the Industrial Revolution, the lighter shaded moths could hide better. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, lots of pollution, so the lighter shaded ones stuck out, the darker ones could hide. Once you started to clean up some of that pollution, and the darker ones could be seen better, and the lighter ones could hide. So it can shift back and forth depending on what's happening in the environment. Okay, so that's the end of your lecture on population genetics and adaptive evolution. In the next set of video lectures, we're gonna talk about phylogenies and the history of life. Until then, this has been Dr. Sage.